Another sunny day in South Wales. More anatomy. Let's talk about the female reproductive system. Okay, uh, yeah, this week we've been talking a bit about the female reproductive system. There are many bits. Um, let's talk about the, like the internal reproductive organs in the female pelvis. Me much of this you'll be familiar with. Much of this is fairly straightforward. Funnily enough, this um, links back to um, the peritoneum video that I did uh, where we talked about the peritoneum and the abdominal cavity because that layers on top of these things and a couple of weird things happen which are difficult to explain so I'll do my best to try and explain those things so some of it will be straightforward we'll look at the viscera so each of the organs we'll talk briefly about blood supply interesting aspects of blood supply um, and there are a whole bunch of ligaments that can be confusing holding these things in place and they are important to hold these things in place um, and uh, the peritoneum comes into that so this model is very good this is um, somewhat typical of the sort of thing we'd produce as a dissection you know you would uh, get into the pelvis essentially from the abdominal cavity once you dissected the abdomen and moved the bowels out of the way um, and then you might even do a, a hemi section here to to split the pelvis in half to see all the structures um, so when you're approaching the anatomy from this direction what do we see we see a mass here so we see a big lump in the midline and this lump is the is the uterus the bladder is most anterior it's next to the pubis bone and you, when the bladder fills up and enlarges you can usually palpate your bladder um, just above the pubis bone so always remember the bladder is most anterior the uterus then is posterior to the bladder but it, it folds anteriorly normally so it kind of is normally flexed anteriorly the vagina comes up into it which we can't really see in this case and then the rectum is posterior so we have um, bladder vagina rectum or bladder vagina uterus on top of it rectum we can see it a bit better here here's the the vertebrae here this is anterior this is posterior here are here's the bladder here's the rectum here's the vagina here this muscular tube so the vagina is leading up to the uterus and here's the uterus here and you can see how it's flexed anteriorly you can also see a number of tubes have been cut through here and a tube here so if this is the bladder what's this tube here that's been cut through ureter yep and the urethra will drain out inferiorly so what are these three tubes here then and here's the rectum so if i pull this in half so we now have this kind of uh, this mid sagittal section you can see that here's the muscular tube of the the vagina and here's the uterus here here's the space of the bladder here's the urethra here now the um the uterus is interesting for a number of reasons it changes throughout the monthly menstrual cycle um, and it has three layers so it has the, the endometrium and that's the layer that changes through the menstrual cycle and then it has the thick layer here of myometrium myo meaning muscle right so this is a muscular layer and then it's covered in a perimetrium um, over the top you know a, a connective tissue covering the, the muscle of the myometrium, the fibres run in lots of different directions and of course the reason there's a thick muscular layer here is for the process of birth so to force squeeze the baby out through the birth canal um, these fibres, muscle fibres running in different directions contract so you're not just squeezing the baby but you're shortening the uterus and squeezing the uterus and you know you're pushing the baby down and out through the birth canal out through the vagina so that's really important you can imagine how much this stretches how much bigger the uterus has got to get so up here this is the fundus the body of the uterus the fundus is up here and it's the fundal height that can be palpated um, with pregnancy so if if a, a woman is pregnant 
as the baby gets larger and the uterus gets larger, the fundal height is measured through the gestation. And, you know, you can measure the normal rate of progress and check that it is normal by doing that. The other interesting thing about the uterus then, before we talk about the endometrium, is the cervical canal here, right? So there's a canal between the space within the uterus and where it opens into the vagina. Uh, so this is the cervix. And because it's a canal, it has two ends. Does that make sense? So the canal opens here into the vagina at the external os, and it opens internally into the uterus at the internal os. Um, and where the external os and the cervix opens into the vagina, I don't know if you can see, but the cervix then, or you know, where the cervix opens into the vagina, it's, um, it's kind of dome-shaped, right? It's curved. Um, and the vagina being a muscular tube means that there must be an edge to that curve. And that's what we're seeing here, yeah? These edges here, and these are the fornices, the vaginal fornices, you've got anterior posterior. It's a circular thing. So these are the fornices. Um, and in the nulliparous woman, as in, so in a woman who hasn't been pregnant, hasn't given birth, then the external os will usually be round. Um, in a woman that has given birth, that will be lost and usually it'll have kind of a, um, a slit or a long external os. So the external os changes shape because when the baby passes through the birth canal, it has to pass through the cervix and the cervix effaces. So while it's um, a thick muscular, while it's a, a canal, during birth, when the head, baby's head engages, it effaces, it gets thinned as it gets spread, right? And then it dilates, so the, the hole in the cervix dilates so the baby can pass through. So the cervix changes shape to allow passage of the baby, and then afterwards it closes up again. The external laws in the cervix of a woman that has given birth looks different. The other thing we can see in here then, what's this important structure? It's the ovary. So there are two ovaries, one on the left, one on the right. Um, and the ovaries are the gonads, the female gonads, so they're the, the counterpart to the testis, the testes in the male. And um, the ovaries produce oocytes, and they also produce um, steroid hormones, they produce um, estrogen and progesterone. And this changes through the monthly cycle. So the endometrial lining of the uterus, um, after menstruation, what's lost during menstruation is the endometrium, much of the endometrium. And then once, the once menstruation has ended, the endometrium will thicken. This is the proliferative phase, right? Proliferative cells are proliferating. It's growing and thickening. And it'll thicken and you'll see coiled arteries in there and glands and, and that sort of thing and it gets thicker and thicker and thicker and what it's doing is is the endometrium is the site for implantation for a blastocyst so if an egg gets fertilized and forms a blastocyst it's going to implant into the endometrium so the endometrium needs to be thick and those arteries and the lacunae and uh, uh, glands and what have you, they're all going to contribute to the formation of the maternal parts of the placenta, right? So basically what happens is that during the proliferative phase the endometrium gets thicker and it gets ready to receive a blastocyst and ready to um, have that blastocyst embedded with it and form a placenta, right? So if the endometrium doesn't thicken normally, then there will be issues with fertility. So the cycle is controlled by luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone to the pituitary. You've heard of the HPO axis, the, the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis. So the ovaries are the bottom, the bottom, the bottom, the, <laughs> you know, the pituitary glands are up here and the hypothalamus is up here and the ovaries are further down. So the ovaries are at the last stage of this. Um, but I don't want to go into the endocrinology, but the monthly cycle is controlled. So after a couple of weeks, then um, the the ovary will release an oocyte and it'll pass into this uh, uterine tube, which we'll look at in a moment. Um, and the endometrium then is thick and it continues to thicken for a few days more and it remains thick for the last couple of weeks of the cycle. 
So this is the lute luteal phase or the secretory phase, waiting for a blastocyst to appear in the uterus and in bed. And if it doesn't, so after about four weeks, after about a month, it is a bit variable. Um, if no implantation has occurred, no blastocyst has appeared and implanted, then menstruation will begin and that endometrial lining will be shed, um, which is another function of the vagina. Right? So that's the endometrium, myometrium, perimetrium, that's the uterus. Now, so the ovaries, um, the ovaries are interesting embryologically. So there's one really big difference between male and female gonads is that male gonads are constantly producing um, new spermatozoa, new cells with new DNA, right? So you've got um, meiosis going on there and producing more spermatozoa. And this is continually ongoing through life. Whereas in the ovaries, the oogonia, the cells from which the oocytes form, all of the oogonia are formed during the fetal period. So at birth, a girl will have all of the oogonia Uogonia, all of the potential oocytes that she can ovulate will already have been made, right? And they're kind of, they're paused through my, at a stage in meiosis. And every month, um, well, what we see, if we look in, in the ovary is we see a cortex and a medulla in the middle, and the medulla's not very interesting. In the cortex, we'll see multiple developing follicles. And the follicle has an oocyte within it, uh, and a layer of cells around it, which is what's forming the follicle, and they, they vary in complexity. And one of those follicles every month will be selected for ovulation in one of the ovaries, and uh, that follicle will release its oocyte. How that works exactly is not entirely understood. Um, but obviously, this isn't going to begin until puberty. And in many people, um, people aren't having babies until their 20s or 30s, or in some cases their 40s, right? So then they, we know that there's a risk, an increased risk of congenital um, abnormalities and what have you in um, when women who are older give birth, right? The reason for that is then that those oocytes were made during the fetal period and they've been stored for 20, 30, 40 years. And then there's a higher risk of DNA damage to those cells during that period, right? The longer a cell is stored, the more likely it is that that cell will have suffered some DNA damage that maybe hasn't been repaired. Um, so that's the big difference between the male gonad and the female gonad. All right, does that make sense? It's quite cool. Um, cool bit of biology. All right, so you can, you can see on this model, here's the ovary out here. It's the yellowy thing, right? And this structure here then, this structure, almost connecting the ovary to the uterus, this is the uterine tube, it used to be called the fallopian tubes. Um, and can you see how the end of the fallopian tube is kind of, has a load of finger-like projections? These are the fimbriae. And the fimbriae's job is, is, can you see how the ovary isn't inside the uterine tube? It's at the end of the uterine tube and the fimbriae kind of partly cover the ovary. So the idea is that the fimbriae, after ovulation, they pick up the oocyte and carry it into the uterine tube. And then the oocyte travels down the uterine tube and into the uterus over four or five days. Now, fertilization. Where does fertilization occur? So if spermatozoa have been added to the uh, female reproductive tract, they're going to swim their way up, and the oocyte is working its way down. Fertilization most often occurs within the uterine tube, right? So fertilization occurs here, and you get your, your zygote and your morula and your blastocyst, that's the developing early embryo. And then it finds its way down into the ovary, and it has formed a blastocyst by that stage four or five days in or so, and then it implants into the endometrium. Simple, right?